Hello, friends. Exciting news. The Truest Fan Podcast is now the Truest Fan Blueprint Podcast. Just one additional word to the title, but we think it is an important word. You see, as Phil Calandra, my partner in this podcast, and I talked about what we were hearing from our audience and the message that we were delivering, we realized that not enough folks understand that our podcast is not just something to listen to. It's a set of action steps that you can take that are based on our blueprint, that whether you're a financial advisor uh, looking to grow your AUM, or you're a business leader looking to grow in your leadership skills, or you're trying to grow more personally to be a better version of yourself, there's a step by step process to do that. And for us, it's a blueprint. And we talk about the blueprint all the time in the work that we do, coaching and consulting uh, with our clients. And we wanna teach that same set of activities to our podcast audience. So buckle your seats, listen to the podcast, but most importantly, ask yourself, what can I do that will make my business or my life better because I've taken the time to take action on one of the ideas that I picked up from in the latest edition. Listen in. Thanks. Happy clients refer you. If they're not happy for whatever reason, they're never going to refer you. They're never going to introduce you to others. And that's why I think it's important going back to what I said before is that you need to identify uh, or qualify them just as much as they're qualifying you. And if it's not a fit, then you begin to recognize that sooner and sooner in the in the process in prospecting and bringing on or onboarding clients. Welcome back to the Truest Fan Blueprint. Um, I'm Rob Brown, along with my co-host, Phil Calandra. Phil, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Rob. Great to be back. Great to be so, back again. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I, I love these conversations because I know that um, it we share a lot of really good practical information that financial advisors can use in their business uh, to immediate um, effect. Um, in the last podcast, uh, we talked about um, the AUM acceleration process, the idea that most advisors, whether you're killing it, bringing in new business, or you're struggling, are always looking to figure out how can I more effectively bring in new business, new AUM from the type of clients that I really enjoy working with. We call them your ultimate clients. Some people might call them your most ideal clients. Um, and uh, to get that process started in our practice when we're coaching advisors, um, we actually start by looking at your existing clients because you can learn a lot by studying where your business is really coming from. Um, and it, in many ways, this comes down to at least first doing an 80-20 analysis. Most advisors get 80% of their business from 20% of their clients, or they have 80% of their assets under management with 20% of their clients. Sometimes it might be 15%, sometimes it might be 12%, but it's you know almost always around that 20% number. So we really wanna understand who that 20% is and what they look like before we go about attracting new ultimate clients, um, build on that a little bit, Phil. I'm, I know that you um, that you understand and agree with that uh, philosophy. Yeah. So if you think it through, the eighty twenty rule shows up in many areas of life. It shows up in many areas of our business. And if you're trying to generate new assets under management, which is uh, essential, I think, if a practice isn't growing, it's dying by default. And the reason that the 80-20 rule works in building assets or in revenue is that you're constantly bringing into the to practice uh, the ultimate client, as we call it, or your avatar client or ideal client. 
And I coach advisors and talk about this frequently in that when you're interviewing a prospect, we often are trained or taught that they're qualifying you as the advice giver, the, the, the advisor professional. And I'd argue that that's only half the truth. You're qualifying them just as much as they are qualifying you. And you want to build in your practice the ultimate client. And that comes from you being confident, articulate, and explaining what it is you do, how you do it. And you're always kind of searching for your ultimate client. And if it doesn't work out that way, then uh, the 80-20 rule isn't going to matter anyway. Right. That's that's absolutely right. You know, um, I think when I first discovered, and this goes back probably 10, 20 years or, um, in, in thinking about it, um, is you have to make the shift from doing business under the auspices of more means more and move to the, the idea that less can mean more. Because when you understand by doing that 80-20 analysis who those ultimate clients are, um, you can add fewer clients and grow more quickly because you're not just taking anybody who comes your way. But until you know if they're really going to fit in to that 20% of your business that's responsible for 80% of your assets or your revenues, you may just uh, completely miss the miss the point and, and continue to attract clients that that are never going to be that ultimate client. Yeah, that's a good point because I think in 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 a lot of practices we hear or you're always trained that you want to move up market, you want to have a million dollar minimum. And and I've worked with advisors that have 2 million dollar minimums. And that's fantastic, obviously fewer clients to drive larger assets under management. That wouldn't fit my practice. My practice is more mass affluent. I don't have above and beyond the holistic, comprehensive planning that I do with clients and that I have done with clients. I don't get into a lot of complex, uh, heavy lifting, uh, maybe business planning or uh, estate planning. We do do that. But my ideal client may be very different than yours, Rob, or some other advisor. So don't think what we're talking about is the ultimate client is some number of assets because I can very effectively manage a book of business that is, uh, you know, 500 to a million, million and a half. I'd say that's kind of my sweet spot, but that might be entirely too low for other firms or other advisors, but it's in the way that you structure, and we'll talk more about this, the client experience, how you craft your communication style, how you develop uh, your ongoing cadence of communication, um, so what we're really talking about is really understanding who works for you, who, who is your ultimate client, uh, irregardless of size. Because I think when people hear this, Rob, they think, well, you know, I, I don't want to, I want to set my minimum higher and higher and higher. And that may be the right strategy for some. I never did that. And I think I have a book of pit business. Uh, the, the clients really get me. They really understand the the type of coaching and and planning advice that I provide, and they refer me like-minded people, and that's the whole point of the ultimate client. But but I would also say, and knowing your business, Phil, that one of the things that's also true is um, even though um, you um, include as your definition of an ultimate client the um, mass affluent, or, there, or that can be part of the definition, that the average size of the relationships you worked with over the years has gotten bigger as you oh, yeah. built your business um, and and not necessarily because you said, I will only take clients with X number of dollars in assets, uh, but because of the other things that are important to you when you're defining that ultimate client, they're naturally going to have a higher level of assets than maybe the clients that you first sure started working with when you built your RIA. Yeah. Oh, very much so. And and that just becomes becomes a natural progression with the quality of work that you're able to provide for clients 
Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk in depth about the client experience and and ultimately uh, referrals, the ultimate referral uh, based business. Uh, happy clients refer you. If they're not happy for whatever reason, they're never going to refer you. They're never going to introduce you to others. And that's why I think it's important going back to what I said before is that you need to identify uh, or qualify them just as much as they're qualifying you. And if it's not a fit, then you begin to recognize that sooner and sooner in the in the process in prospecting and bringing on or onboarding clients. Yeah. You know, um, as you were talking, Phil, I was reminded of a client uh, that I worked with, um, I guess it's probably been a dozen years ago now. And um, he was doing um, over $2 million in fee-based business as, as a pure fee-based business practice. Um, he only had 80 relationships. Sure. Um, and when I suggested to him that we do an 80-20 analysis to figure out who his ideal client was, he said, that's crazy. I only have 80 clients. What does it matter if I'm working with some non-ultimate clients? Um, but he um, uh, stopped pushing back. He had agreed to do the 80-20 on his business. And what he realized was that for him, when he really looked at that 20% of his clients who were generating about 85% of his revenues, um, they were all very complicated clients, executives with, with stock options and complicated financial plans, and they were a challenge to him. Um, and in the end, he decided to give up um, not 80% of his clients, but he gave up 20 of his clients that represented um, a quarter of the number of clients he was working with in total and over $200,000 in revenues because he knew that if he could find somebody else who could serve those clients better, he'd get some time back in his business and for himself to serve more of his ultimate clients and that if he just added a couple of more of those ultimate clients, he would blow past um, his the the revenues that he was giving up. So doing that analysis and really taking the time to understand who your ultimate client is and starting with this 80-20 review is, is really important uh, because it's not just about, as you said, Phil, it's not just about the numbers. It's about what do those numbers mean in reality as you begin to decide who am I going to invite into my practice? Um, it, because um, that should be something that um, every advisor holds precious over time is who did they want? It's like, it's like playing golf. You know, who wants to go out and play a sport that takes four hours at a clip uh, with three other people that you don't like? <laughs> and if you wouldn't do it for four hours playing golf, you know, why would you do it for four years or 40 years um, as an advisor taking care of clients that you really don't have an affinity for? Yeah, that's a good analogy. But I, and, and real quickly, the only thing that came to my mind when you were talking about that scenario with your client, Rob, was a lot of advisors struggle with when do they add the associate advisor? When do they bring in another team member? You know, we could talk for hours on how to build teams. I'm sure we will talk about that. Um, but that's a great example of when you are ready to then move or splinter off transition pieces of your book to an associate advisor. Um, and it might be somebody that's a junior to you, someone younger. Uh, I, you know, I think this happens to be the golden age for younger advisors. We're, we're all getting older and older, but the younger crowd of advisors is just coming up. And that's a great way to think about how to build, uh, build out your team um, on the advisory side, you know, not necessarily the, the, the heartbeat of the practice, which is operations. But. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great point. And it's a, it really is a topic for another day, but in this particular case, this also helped the advisor make the decision not to add to his team because he didn't okay. want other people on his team to serve non-ultimate clients. 
And so it was better for him to find an advisor outside of his organization that could do a good job for them. He was, he was very careful with them. Uh, and, and he was passing along a quarter of a million dollars worth of business. So it wasn't chump change. It would be a good business for somebody to buy, but he found a new home for that business as opposed to using it to build a team. Um, but it's also another example of why it's important to know who your ultimate client is. Um, Phil, any last um, parting thoughts on the importance of this um, ultimate client decision and the 80-20 analysis that you'd like to add to the conversation? Ah, yeah, you know, I think uh, make your life easier. Hey, we're, we're, in this, uh, we're, we're in this to help people. We're in this to do well by helping people. And um, I, I think if you go through the exercise that we're speaking of, if you need help, if you need resources, let us know. But uh, it'll sure make your life more enjoyable. And I know it did mine over the years as I've gone through this. So go for it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great piece of advice um, because, you know, that is kind of part of our premise and the work that we do in our coaching is to help our clients make their businesses simpler. And this is one um, in, uh, specific way that you can do that. So let's uh, let's sign off for now, Phil. Thanks for another great yeah. um, episode of the Truest Fan Blueprint uh, podcast. Um, I would invite you all, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing uh, with our clients, uh, to go to truestfancoaching.com. Take care and remember that we're always rooting for your success.